There we go. Um, Sarah is an author, a speaker, an educator, a podcaster, and blogger on all things related to food history. She was featured on the History Channel miniseries, The Food That Built America, as well as NPR, The Atlantic, CNN, and more. Um, really excited for the program tonight. I'm sure it's gonna be great. So at this point, I'll just turn it over to you, Sarah. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for having me, Catherine. Um, so I'm just gonna remind everybody, if you're not muted, if you could please mute yourself so we don't have any weird background noise, because <laughs> that does happen every once in a while. And my dog is with me right now. She's asleep next to me. But if you hear any barking at any point, that's my, my dog, Sweetie Pie. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about nutrition science. And this is something that I got into um, a number of years ago, really back in graduate school when I started first researching um, home economics. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. Let me just get my screen share up here. Hold on, where am I? What? Sorry, it's not bringing up the screen that I wanna share. Where is it? I have too many windows open apparently. There we go. <laughs> okay, let me just get this slideshow started. Okay, so the topic of tonight's talk um, is nutrition science. It's like I said, I call it when sugar was good for you, the development of nutrition science in America. Um, and obviously this is not a super comprehensive uh, talk, otherwise I'm sure it would be hours long. Um, but So we're gonna focus mainly on the late 19th and early 20th century um, going into uh, post-war, and then we'll talk a little bit about how nutrition science um, is portrayed in the media and kind of what that means for our everyday lives. So we're going to start really early. Um, early nutrition uh, was not particularly scientific, although we start to get some sort of interest in diet and human diet um, kind of in the Enlightenment period, particularly in the early 19th century. But one of the um, sort of, I guess you could say, common sense ideas about nutrition in the United States, which is based primarily on the foodways of Europe at that time, was that bread was the staff of life, right? So most people were eating um, fairly carbohydrate-rich diets. Uh, the United States was unique compared to a lot of other countries in that a wide variety of people from a wide variety of backgrounds had a lot more access to meat than they did in other areas of the world. Um, and the conventional wisdom by the end of the 19th century is that nutrition science meant that you had an adequate balance of fats, protein, and ash, which is later discovered to be sugars or carbohydrates, right? That those discoveries mainly happen in the mid 19th century. Um, and vegetables were largely considered worthless, um, except for their value with providing fiber, dietary fiber. In the late Victorian period in particular, um, Victorians were fairly well obsessed with dyspepsia, um, which is basically stomach and digestive troubles. There's lots of patent medicines around constipation, right, to cure constipation because people were not eating very many vegetables and the vegetables that they were eating were fairly starchy. Um, but because at the time, the scientific emphasis or analysis of vegetables was that um, they were primarily composed of fiber and water, they didn't really have very many, what would later become known as calories. Uh, they were considered nutritionally worthless, although valuable, as I said, for their fiber and also to provide bulk in the diet of the poor, people who could not really afford um, a lot of fat or meat. So by the end of the 19th century, the conventional wisdom is that beef, milk, butter, sugar, refined white sugar, and white bread are the healthiest diet, right? Because beef is the best protein. Milk, we'll get into milk later, but milk is a very good food for everyone. Butter is the best fat. Sugar is refined, white sugar is the purest 
form of carbohydrate and refined white bread is also a very pure form of carbohydrate, right? So that's your health food of the late 19th century. There's also in the late 19th century, um, starting to be a lot of interest in food purity. So in 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act is finally passed, which prevents, not super enforced early on, but it prevents um, adulteration of foods, which is like non-edible things added to foods, either as a preservative or um, as a stretcher, right, to make them cheaper. Um, but there's this concept in American culture at that time that things that are white are pure um, and things that are white are clean and things that are white are generally better. So white milk, sugar, white, refined white sugar, white bread, which is often made from bolted flour were considered um, desirable. Getting back to bread a little bit, bolted white bread um, means that the whole grain wheat flour was basically sifted through um, sheets of fabric, like a bolt of fabric. That's why it's called bolted uh, white flour. Um, so that removes all of the germ, which is the brown part of the bread. And that becomes a little bit of a problem for some people and some of the earliest health reformers, not necessarily um, using academic science to make these determinations, but some of the earliest reformers focus on whole grain bread as a health food. If you've ever heard of Graham bread or Graham crackers, um, that's named after Sylvester Graham, who was a proponent of, of whole grain um, bread and flour. And just as an aside, the wheat flour, the whole wheat flour that you get in the store today is actually a white flour with some wheat germ put back in it. <laughs> um, it's not actually whole ground wheat. Um, whole grains tend to have the uh, oil still in them, which means they're not super shelf stable, um, which is why a whole wheat bread that you find in the grocery store generally just has some of the wheat germ added back in. It's not actually just wheat berries that have been ground up. You can find graham flour um, by some companies, which actually is the whole entire grain, right? Or sometimes you'll see entire grain on labels and that's what that means. All right, so that's just my little aside about bread. So one of the earliest things that we start doing with nutrition science, and this is sort of not in super chronological order because there's a lot of stuff happening at the same time. So just bear with me because if I put it in chronological order, it would have been really confusing. Um, but one of the most impactful things I think on American nutrition was the application of calories to nutrition. And that was done by a man named Wilbur O. Atwater, who was born in 1944 in New York. He was a professor of chemistry at Wellesleyan University. Um, and he was also the director of a USDA experimental station located at Wellesleyan. So the experimental stations um, came out of the Hatch Act, which funded, so I think it's 1867, which funded agricultural colleges around the country. Um, and one of the things that those agricultural colleges were supposed to do to benefit the public was to establish experimental stations where they would produce um, agricultural research that could then be used by the general public. So these research stations were looking at things like how to best deal with pests, um, how to fertilize crops and crop rotation. Uh, they were developing new varieties of fruits and vegetables. They were researching um, into livestock breeding. Um, but Wilbur o. Atwater was actually researching human nutrition at his experimental station. So he researches calories, metabolism, and what are the dietary requirements uh, for humans to live. Um, so this is kind of something that was going on with a lot of groups and different scientists at the end of the 19th and into the early 20th century, trying to figure out, you know, what are people supposed to eat? What is the most healthful diet? Um, and ironically, that kind of comes out of experiment station research that had been done into livestock. What is the best diet for livestock to consume? 
in order, for instance, for a dairy cows to produce the best milk or for meat animals to grow the fastest and with you know the best combination of protein and fat and things like that. So human nutrition actually comes out of that research. Um, he's one of the first people to apply the concept of the calorie to human metabolism. So a calorie is actually a, a measure of heat that was originally invented to apply to steam engines in the 1830s. Um, but they, again, they've been doing experiments with small animals to see how their metabolisms work. And uh, Atwater was one of the first people to apply that concept to humans. And the way that he did that was with something called a calorie meter. I think that's how you pronounce it. So a calorie meter, um, there's a lot of different scientific applications for them, but basically it's measuring, um, like I said, the heat and energy produced by something. And usually you do this by burning it, right? So that's how you figure out the calories in food. You burn a food basically in a controlled environment um, and you can discern how much energy that food produces, which is kind of crazy to think about, but that's how they did it. So his calorie meter um, was person-sized. Uh, so this is one of his human test subjects uh, leaving, it's called the respirator calorie meter in his laboratory at Wellesleyan University. Um, as I said, it's a unit of heat. And his human test subjects, he used largely young college-aged men, right? That's who a lot of human test subjects are for research is college people, um, college students. So what he would do is he would put them inside this basically a sealed compartment and he would measure their rate of respiration. Um, he would res measure their rate of perspiration. Um, he would have them do different activities inside of it to see how, try and figure out how they metabolize things differently. And his resulting research with both calories and the calorie meter um, really helped set nutrition standards in the United States. Now, Atwater himself uh, tried to communicate that you know, this is a fairly small sample size and that um, basically you couldn't apply these same standards to everyone because the population differs so widely. Um, but that's not really what happens, which is kind of a theme in nutrition science. Um, so we get things like this instead. So when his research on calories first comes out in the 1890s, 1900s, um, it becomes kind of a fad to order 100 calorie um, portions of things. So this is an example. Um, this is the USDA Bureau of Home Economics uh, training housewives essentially to think about calories in their everyday lives. And they even had manuals that would um, help you calculate the calories in certain foods based on formulas that they had developed based on his research with calorie meters. Um, but I just find this interesting that this image is from around 1910. And if you think about today, you, for a while, I think it's not quite as common anymore, but you can still buy 100 calorie packs of snacks, right? I don't know why Americans have just sort of grasped 100 calories as sort of this idealized <laughs> amount of calories to eat, um, maybe because it was easy to keep track of. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that becomes part of the popular culture almost instantly. Um, you see some uh, restaurant menus start having, oh, I have 100 calories of this or 100 calories of that. Um, it tends to be sort of more upper crust stuff, but I just find it very interesting that this is a connection that we still make today. Um, so some of the people who helped popularize calories and some of Atwater's research are home economists. So I wanted to introduce Ellen Swallow Richards, who's considered the mother of home economics. Um, she was born in 1941 and died in 1911. Uh, she attended Vassar College and was originally interested in studying astronomy, but thought she would have uh, more um, job opportunities, career opportunities, if she switched to chemistry. So she did. Uh, she's one of the first women to study at MIT. 
And she sort of ingratiated herself to her male professors by doing things like offering to sweep up after class or, you know, fix their buttons or sort of be like the helpful female student, right? And that's how she got through school. Um, and she was not the only person who was applying science to home care and nutrition, but she's one of the first people to really apply academic level science and experimentation um, to the running of the home. Um, in 1899, she and a number, another number of other people attend something called the Lake Placid Conference, which is in Lake Placid, New York, um, run by Melvin Dewey, I think librarians can correct me on this, the inventor of the Dewey Decimal System. He and his wife held a conference every year. It's kind of like they had different topics and they brought people in to sort of convene and discuss them. And so the topic of the 1899 conference um, was domestic science and nutrition. Um, domestic science is a term that Ellen Swallow Richards detested. <laughs> so at that conference, they coined the term home economics. Um, and the following year, she and some of the other attendees found the Journal of Home Economics um, and basically the Association of Home Economics, which is still around today. And that journal is still around today. And that becomes the academic journal of home economics. And home economists um, play a really important role in nutrition science and the dissemination of information about nutrition science throughout the 20th century. Um, a lot of the people I'm going to be talking about today are the laboratory scientists, but nutrition scientists and home economists, um, mainly women. There are only a couple of women in my talk, sadly, but uh, <laughs> we'll get to them. Um, they're the ones who are really communicating nutrition science to everyday people, to housewives, to high school students, to college students. Um, they're working in corporate settings, in food production settings. Um, and so they really help popularize a lot of these ideas. We're also gonna talk a little bit about milk. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip of water here. I mentioned earlier in the talk that, you know, the ideal health foods of the 19th century were beef, butter, milk, refined sugar, and white bread. And milk is an important one because it was considered the perfect food. And it's considered the perfect food because it has fats, protein, and sugars, carbohydrates, all contained in one natural food. So that was considered the ultimate health food at that time because it contained all of these essential things um, that were considered to be the height of nutrition science at the time. Milk was also strongly associated with children and health. Um, it was considered an essential food for children and there's a lot of rhetoric um, throughout the 19th, but especially at the turn of the 20th century about how important it is for children to consume milk as part of a healthy diet. Um, the purity of milk was also very important. We talked a little bit about how white foods were very closely associated with, with purity. Milk is one of those things. But also the issue with milk is that um, there had been a number of scandals throughout the 19th century uh, with impure milk, particularly in the 1860s with tuberculosis in milk that had killed a number of children and also adulteration of milk with chalk, with bluing, with other non-food um, substances. And so really, I had mentioned that the Food and Drug Act of 1906 um, got passed. And that was largely the work of middle and upper middle class women um, trying to have food safety standards for children. So you can thank milk purity and impurity uh, for most of our modern food safety standards. Um, just want to go a little bit into uh, another thing with milk and purity and commercialization has to do with condensed milk. So this is an image, an advertisement for Nestle's Swiss milk, which is the canned condensed milk. Um, and it says is strongly re recommended by the medical profession, right? The purest cow's milk. So that's playing into fears about um, the purity and safety of milk. Here in the United States, um, Borden's condensed milk 
uh, plays a, large, a big role in that. And a lot of people in the United States are first introduced to condensed milk through the American Civil War when it becomes part of a soldier's ration. Um, but fresh raw milk, which is not something people maybe think about, but fresh raw milk was the highest standard, which is another reason why purity was so important. So I just have a couple of image examples here. This is actually from World War I. And this is an, a propaganda poster, an advertising poster for the Belgian Children's Milk Fund. Um, during the First World War, Belgium was kind of overrun by German troops um, and the Belgian people were really suffering. And so fundraising for women and children um, and to get food to them, they were experiencing some famine conditions was very important. But you see, it's not the Belgian Children's Food Fund, it's the Belgian Children's Milk Fund because milk was considered so nutritionally important for children at that time. So this is another one from a pair of propaganda posters from the 1940s. Um, so milk continues to be seen as sort of this essential food um, through World War II and into the 1950s, the post-war period. Um, I love these because they're such great design, but also because um, I think it's just kind of really interesting marketing that milk for summer thirst and then the in the summer and then the wintertime milk for warmth, right? Trying to get people to drink this perfect food. All right, so now we're gonna get a little bit into vitamins. I find vitamin history very interesting in large part because like most of nutrition science, it is so recent compared to a lot of other food discoveries. Um, so we're gonna go largely in chronological order um, and I'm not gonna cover all of them. Well, do we have, I do have a little vitamin timeline that we can look at toward the end. Um, but I thought I would start with how we figure out vitamins, right? And we mainly figure out vitamins because of vitamin deficiencies. So one of the oldest vitamin deficiencies that we know about is scurvy. Um, this image is from the journal of Henry Walsh Mahan, um, who was a convict um, or was aboard a convict ship in the UK and he's illustrating some of the effects of scurvy. Not super appetizing, but I thought very interesting. Um, so knowledge of scurvy in the Western world dates back to the 15th century, which is when Europeans first started doing really long range um, ocean travel, right? And so the symptoms of scurvy are you have bruising, your gums bleed, and eventually you die, right? Um, and scurvy is a vitamin C deficiency, but we didn't know that until quite late. Um, so the primary causes are lack of fresh food on long voyages, right? And the cures, we knew the cures as early as the 18th century, the early 18th century. So mostly um, people thought that if you just had fresh food, right, that would cure scurvy. Um, but we started to realize that sauerkraut and citrus fruit, particularly limes, um, were used as a cure for scurvy. And if you've ever wondered why people around the world who eat very meat heavy diets don't get scurvy, it's because raw animal blood contains vitamin C, which is kind of an interesting and unique thing that we don't think about, but if you consume raw animal blood, you will get the vitamin C, <coughs> excuse me, and you won't get scurvy. It has to be raw though. If you cook it, the vitamin C dissipates. Um, we also have another early vitamin deficiency is rickets. So rickets have kind of been around here and there for a while, but it's really not until the Victorian period that it starts to become a problem. Um, so we have an image here of children with rickets at a Scottish orphanage in about 1900, and you can see their legs are bowed and kind of messed up. So rickets is a deformation and softening of the bones, and in children in particular, it affects their growth plates. Not so much in adults, because we don't really need our growth plates anymore, but in children, the damage is particularly pronounced. Um, rickets is a vitamin D deficiency. So why is it not really around until the end of the 19th century? Well, in part, it's not really around until the end of the 19th century because um, people really didn't spend a lot of time exposed to the sun 
particularly in the United Kingdom and northern regions of Europe and the United States. Um, when you go outside, you're all covered up, right? You're wearing a hat. If you're a woman, you might have a parasol, you're wearing long sleeves, your legs are covered. Um, a lot of people, only their hands were exposed, and even then, a lot of people wore gloves. So the primary cause is lack of sunlight, right? So when you're exposed to the sun, um, uh, bacteria on your skin actually synthesizes vitamin D um, with exposure to the sun. So if you are completely denied exposure to the sun, as probably these poor children in this orphanage were, um, you get rickets. There are some non-sunlight related cures. Obviously a cure is sunlight. Um, cod liver oil is also very high in vitamin D. And then if you have grass fed milk in particular, um, it gives you calcium, which is another way that you can help deal with rickets. Um, and it also contains vitamin D. So one of the researchers um, who helped discover vitamin D is Sir Edward Mellenby. Uh, he's a British doctor turned professor. And in 1913, uh, he was tasked by the government with researching the origin of rickets. So by this time, rickets was becoming kind of a national emergency in the UK. Um, and people were trying to figure out what caused it and what they could do uh, to stop it. So between 1919 and 1922, um, he discovers vitamin D via cod liver oil um, and its role in rickets. So cod liver oil had kind of traditionally been um, a folk cure for rickets and just kind of generally administered to children as like a health supplement, but he's really the first one who isolates it specifically and its role um, yeah, as a treatment of rickets. Uh, another early vitamin deficiency that plays a role um, in the discovery of vitamins is beriberi. It's first discovered in third century China. So this is one of the oldest vitamin deficiencies. Um, it causes swelling of the legs, weakness, shortness of breath. And there's that's generally considered dry beriberi. There's also wet beriberi, um, which can, has all of those symptoms, but then also sometimes attacks the cardiovascular system. Um, and again, eventually ends in death. Uh, and it is a thiamine or vitamin B1 deficiency. And the primary cause is a diet high in polished white rice and not a lot of anything else. <laughs> so um, it was a primary deficiency in Asia because that's where most of the rice consuming people of the world lived at the time. Um, and it was discovered in part to be a dietary illness um, by a doctor who worked for the Japanese Navy. Because at the time, a lot of um, workers and people, sailors and people working for the Navy, part of their pay was a ration of rice, right? So you get that for free. So if you can live on just the white rice, you don't have to buy other food, but they didn't really know this at the time, but that gives you berry berry, right? Um, oops, sorry, the cure, that's the last, I just need to edit that, that's from the last slide. The cure for berry berry is to eat um, foods with thiamine B1 in them, which when it comes to rice is you're eating less processed or brown Rice. So white rice, if that's the only thing you're, you'll eat, you won't have enough thiamine. It'll give you beriberi if you eat the brown rice. However, that still has the germ, um, which won't give you beriberi because that's where the thiamine is located. So Christian Aikman um, was one of the people who studied beriberi and made a connection with diet. Um, he worked in Java for the Dutch government in the 1880s and 90s. He actually ran um, a medical college there. And he was sent in large part to examine the causes of beriberi. And he was one of the first, the first European, we already talked about the Japanese naval officer who connected it to diet, but he's the first European to connect it um, to diet. So one of the things that's happening um, with vitamin deficiencies in general at this time is people thought that they were uh, illnesses 
right? That they were diseases, that they were caused maybe by bacteria or bad air or waterborne things, that they might be contagious. Uh, so a lot of the research in the late 19th and early 20th century is kind of establishing whether or not these diseases are any of these things. And so the scientists that I'm talking about today are the people who are doing the research to realize that no, actually this is connected to diet. Um, he was actually awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine toward the very end of his life for his impact on vitamin research. It's an award that he shared with the scientists that I'm gonna be talking about in a minute. Um, but sadly, he died of cancer just a year later. So he actually did not um, discover the vitamin involved, vitamin B1 with beriberi, but he was one of the first people to connect it to diet. Um, Sir Frederick Allen Hopkins is his co-Nobel Prize winner. Um, in 1912, he published a paper on an experiment with carb carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, where he fed only that plus water to rats, and they started to get sick. So that was a very important paper because it established that this conventional wisdom about nutrition science that really all you need are carbohydrates, proteins, and fats was not accurate. There were these accessory food factors that existed that we didn't know what they were, but they were necessary for health. Um, during World War I for the British government, he studied margarine and whether or not it was as helpful as butter. And he is one of the first people to recommend that margarine be fortified, right, with what becomes known as vitamin D. Um, and again, he's awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine with Christian Aikman for their impact on vitamin research. So another vitamin deficiency, which I think is maybe less well known, is pellagra. Um, it's discovered as early as the 1730s in Spain. And the symptoms are skin lesions and sores, uh, skin light sensitivity, diarrhea, dementia, and eventual death. And it turns out that the cause of pellagra is vitamin B3 or niacin deficiency. Um, and this becomes really prevalent in the United States in the latter half of the 19th century and into the 20th century, particularly in the rural South where people were eating a lot of corn and cornmeal. Now, corn does contain niacin, but if you just eat ground up dried corn as in cornmeal, um, that niacin is not available to you. Your body is not able to metabolize it. Um, however, the people who invented corn, indigenous people, um, knew that you had to do use a process called nixtamalization, which is where you soak dried corn in a lye solution or you know, water and wood ashes, which creates lye, uh, which basically dehulls the corn, but also makes um, the niacin available for your body to absorb. So masa, which is what tortillas, corn tortillas are made out of, um, has been, is corn that has been nixtamalized and so the niacin is available. So you can live on nixtamalized corn and not get pellagra if it has, because you've nixtamalized it and the niacin is available. So the primary causes are over-reliance on unnixtamalized corn, right? Um, and then the cures are food with available niacin. So people who, um, like niacin is also available in meat and some vegetables and stuff like that. So people who had a more varied diet, who could afford a more varied diet, um, were able to avoid pellagra, but people who were poorer and had to subsist on a much more limited diet were the primary victims of pellagra. Um, Dr. Joseph Goldberger, who is an American immigrant from Hungary, has a really cool story. He went to New York City public schools and then went to medical school. Um, he's actually, an, he was actually an epidemiologist by training. Um, but in 1914, the government asked him to examine pellagra and see if he could figure out what was causing it. Um, so at the time, the prevalent theory about pellagra is that it was a germ, right? That it was contagious, it was some kind of bacteria or virus or something. Um, 
And he did a series of studies that were known as the filth studies, where he and his colleagues took like, they got blood infusions from people with pellagra. They took like pus from their sores. They took nasal mucus and basically tried to infect themselves with pellagra. And obviously they didn't get it because it wasn't a germ. So that was a very controversial study at the time. Um, and the Phil studies were sort of the sensationalist thing that got attached to him. But his theory was that it was a nutrition deficiency. And he ended up being right. But he died in 1929 before it was officially confirmed, right? So he is one of the early people who really paves the way for later scientists to confirm his research. So this is Kazimir Funk, who is a Polish scientist who ends up doing the majority of his work in the United States. He was inspired by Aikman's work on Berry Berry. And in 1912, he publishes a paper that posits that there are a series of things that he later calls vital vitamins. And his, his spelling actually has an E on the end after vital amines, right? He thought they were types of amino acids, which turns out to be wrong, but that's how we get the name vitamin. So he posited that there was an anti-beriberi, anti-scorbutic, which is an anti-scurvy element, an anti-pelagric and an anti-rachitic um, or anti-rickets uh, element in food, right? And that was what prevented people from getting these things on a regular basis. And people who did not have access to these food-based elements, that's what caused um, their deficiency. He also published a book that same year outlining all of his theories. Um, and his work was very widely read uh, and went on to inspire a lot of other scientists um, to do more work into what he called vitamins. So Elmer McCullum is one of the people who starts to isolate um, and discover more of these elements. So he was born in Kansas. Um, he's a biochemist working in the United States. And interestingly, he's one of the first people to work with rat colonies. So he would do these diet experiments with um, colonies of rats. Uh, in 1913, with the help of a home economist named Marguerite Davis, who was working for free, which, you know, typical, um, he isolates vitamin A. In 1915, also with Marguerite Davis, he isolates vitamin B. Um, with another assistant, Cornelia Kennedy, in 1916, they named the subcategories of vitamin B. Um, in 1917, he moves to Johns Hopkins. He does research about fluorine and tooth decay. He discovers vitamins D and E, and he does a lot of research into trace dietary minerals, which are also essential for human health. Um, and then in, 19, in the 1920s, he names vitamin D, and he, there's a little bit of controversy because he's very connected to the dairy industry and in his work. Um, and he is one of the first people to advocate for fortifying um, milk with vitamin D. Um, and there's actually in the early 20th century, particularly into World War II, there's a lot of interest in vitamin D fortification again, because it's going to prevent rickets in children. Um, and in the United States, it's largely just milk and margarine that are fortified with vitamin D. But in Europe, they also were fortifying like breakfast cereals and bread and stuff. And they actually had some cases of vitamin D poisoning because of that. Um, so they kind of dialed it back a little and focused just on milk and butter fortification like the United States did. All right, so now we're gonna go over our vitamin timeline because as I said, we weren't super in chronological order and there is a lot of kind of confusing things happening simultaneously. So I thought we would do a little bit of chronology to get them straight in everybody's heads. So 1912, we have Casimir Funk posits that vitamins exist um, and it's a nutritional deficiency and he discovers vitamin B1, also known as thiamine. Um, in 1912, vitamin C is discovered actually by multiple people. Um, it's attributed to the people who publish first, but they publish like two different groups of scientists publish papers within a couple of months of each other discovering vitamin C. Um, 
In 1912-13, Elmer McComb and Marguerite Davis discover vitamin A. Um, 1915, he discovers vitamin B. Uh, 1919 to 1922, Edward Mellonby discovers vitamin D. Um, in 1922, University of California researchers Herbert Evans and Catherine Bishop discover vitamin E in leafy green vegetables, uh, which also has vitamin C, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, 1926, D.T. Smith and E.G. Hendrick discover vitamin B2, also known as rib riboflavin. 1933, Lucy Wills discovers folic acid. And if you're wondering why that's a woman, that's because folic acid is essential for pregnant mothers. So that's why it's a woman scientist who discovers that one. Uh, 1934, Paul Gorgon discovers vitamin B6. 1937, Conrad LVM who's actually an American, <laughs> um, discovers niacin. Uh, and then in 1947, vitamin A is first synthesized. So vitamins in popular culture um, in the 1920s and 30s and earlier, but particularly in the 1920s and 30s, as these vitamins are being discovered, people start to get kind of obsessed with vitamins. There are a lot of health fads going on at this time. Um, including some very dubious health fads with uh, radium, <laughs> which I won't even get into. I did a podcast on it if anybody wants to listen to it. Um, but you start to get vitamin supplements. So Mastin's yeast vitamin tablets, not vitamin, vitamin, right? Lots of different interesting spellings of things going on at this time also. Uh, were first introduced in 1916. This is an advertisement from 1921. And it's one of the first multivitamins, right? So it's a little pill that's based in yeast that has basically all the vitamins that had been discovered up until that point, plus phosphorus and some other minerals. Um, and they're designed to give you energy, right? So this says they give firm flesh pep an increased energy and they're connecting it to weight loss and complexion and energy. And vitamin supplements have kind of an interesting story because they're not really, they don't really come out of the academic research medical field. They're kind of more patent medicine. And some of the early doctors and researchers did not recommend them, right? But vitamin supplements have become kind of this whole thing that we'll maybe talk about a little bit later, but it really starts in the 19 teens and 20s. Um, World War II has a big impact in vitamins in popular culture. And you saw there was an, a lot of research um, discoveries of vitamins leading up to World War II. Um, and during World War II, we kind of have a nutrition panic a little bit. So uh, when we declare war in 1941, um, 1941, 1942, and we start the draft, there's everybody who gets drafted has to be have a health checkup, right? And we're just coming off of the Great Depression. And there's this report that comes out that says up to 47% of the young men being drafted are malnourished. And probably it wasn't actually that high of a number, but that's the number that was reported. And it causes like this panic in the federal government and in the public. Um, so you start to get a huge emphasis on vitamins and vitamin enrichment. Um, so a lot of the foods post-war that become very popular um, are based on efforts to enrich everyday people's lives with vitamins that maybe they were deficient in. Um, so things like Wonder Bread, right, and vitamin enriched cereals that starts during World War II. You get the whole school lunch movement. Um, this is a movement that starts during the Great Depression and even before, but really takes off during World War II as a way to ensure that the general population is healthy enough to be drafted, basically. That's how we get the school lunch movement. Post-war, it becomes more about how do we absorb agricultural surpluses, which is a whole nother thing. Um, there have been a number of really interesting 
books written about uh, the school lunch movement, but in part it's because there's this panic about are our children nourished, right, as a whole. Um, there's also a lot of interest in nutrition in relation to rationing, right, and making sure that you are supplementing your ration adequately in order to have good nutrition. And this comes out of World War II, and it's basically the precursor to the food pyramid, which is now the My Plate um, thing, which is basically the federal government is recommending the types of foods that you should eat every day in order to have good health. So in World War II, that's the basic seven. Um, and the seven groups are butter and fortified margarine has its own group for vitamin A, green and yellow vegetables, um, oranges, tomatoes, and grapefruit, right? That's for vitamin C. They also have raw cabbage on there and greens. Um, potatoes, vegetables, and other fruits, which is basically for starch, milk and milk products for um, calcium, meat, poultry, fish, or eggs. They also have beans and peas and stuff in there um, for protein. And then the last one, can I read it? Yes, bread, flour, and cereals. Um, so you are supposed to eat some of each of those seven basic food groups every day. Um, the other thing that they really emphasized during World War II is keeping the vitamin content in foods. So this is from a little booklet um, on cooking and nutrition during World War II, and this is specifically about vegetables. And so prior to World War II, essentially, um, most vegetables, cooked vegetables in the United States were cooked to death. People would do stuff like they would soak vegetables before cooking them. They would boil them for like an hour sometimes. Um, and it just, they would like throw away the water, which we totally do today. But the recommendation in World War II was to not soak your vegetables, right? To keep them chilled because the longer vegetables sit, um, particularly this example is peas, um, shelled peas. And he let them just sit. They pretty much, as soon as you pick them, they start to convert their natural sugars to starch. Um, and then also don't let cut vegetables sit out because they'll oxidize. And the next page, which I probably should just put up here, the next page is about cooking. So there's a lot of emphasis in World War II about retaining the vitamin and mineral content by cooking vegetables in a very small amount of water, by not overcooking vegetables, and by reusing um, the liquids from cooking vegetables to make gravies or for soup, or sometimes they recommend you just drink it chilled, which we wouldn't really do today. But if you live in the South and you've ever had pot liquor or seen people drink pot liquor from greens as like a health tonic, that's probably where that comes from. So the other thing that happens is there's a fair amount of research that goes into um, vitamin A and night sight, right? So um, night blindness is a real condition that vitamin A does help alleviate, but during World War II in the United States and especially in Great Britain, there was a real emphasis on eating carrots in particular, so orange vegetables, yellow and green vegetables um, to help improve your sight. Now, for a healthy person, the improvement is pretty negligible, um, but this was one of the things that people were very concerned about, and so that becomes a lot of the propaganda to get people to eat more of this vegetable. Um, there is a World Carrot Museum in the UK if anyone cares to look them up. Um, and they have they talk a lot about the role of carrot propaganda in World War II relating to um, night sight and night blindness. Because of course, when you have blackout, right, you need to be able to see in the dark. So that's what a lot of that propaganda is around. This is a delightful little trio of magazine advertisements. Um, the first one is for Doughboy Donuts, which are vitamized, right? So they have added vitamins, but they're donuts. And um, I like this advertisement in particular because I'm also a World War I historian. 
and it has bunnies again. Doughboy donuts do their bit again. So doughboy, obviously it's a term from World War I. Donuts were very closely associated with the front lines of Europe and World War I and like Red Cross um, and Salvation Army girls. Um, and do your bit is a slogan from World War I. So here we are in World War II. We're back at war. And this time, Doughboy Donuts are even better because they have vitamins in them, right? So that's one from 1941. Um, Libby's, who is now best known for their canned pumpkin, um, actually got its start in like tomato juice and uh, beef stock, believe it or not. But here they're very closely associating tomato juice, but vitamin C as part of their advertising. That's from 1942. And then this last one is a little cartoon about two girls in a play and one of them is super energetic and the other one isn't. And she's asking, how do you get all your energy? She says, I eat Kellogg's Pep for vitamins. So Kellogg's cereal had a type of cereal named Pep that was its like sole redeeming quality was that it was vitamin enriched, right? So vitamin enrichment, synthesizing artificial vitamins and putting them in foods that might not otherwise have those vitamins is a thing that starts really in World War II. Post-war. Post-war gets a little weird with vitamins. So again, we have vitamin donuts. Um, there's a lot of emphasis post-war on drinking your vitamins. Um, Ovaltine in particular uh, becomes quite famous and um, quite prolific in its advertisements connecting vitamins to children's health, even though it's a sugary chocolate drink. <laughs> um, and then we also have Adele Davis, who I love, but who has kind of a fraught history. If you've seen my cookbook talk, you heard me talk about her before, um, but she plays a fascinating role in vitamins. So she has a nutrition and home economics background. Um, and she is an author of a number of books. And her primary nutrition advice is based very much um, on the nutrition advice of World War II, which is fairly sound because it's based a lot in um, like nutrition around vitamins and minerals and nutrients um, and less on around calories. So she really, she's a proponent of milk. There she is with a big glass of milk. She puts milk and dried powdered milk in everything, um, organ meats, cooking vegetables to retain their vitamins, whole grains, less sugar. If you are gonna eat sugar, make it like blackstrap molasses because that's full of minerals. Um, so she kind of makes a name for herself that way. She becomes sort of the, the nutrition guru of hippies basically in the 1960s. Um, she kind of invents granola and yogurt and all these things that become popular at the time. Um, but in the late 1960s, she becomes discredited. And it's largely because of her last three books, Let's Have Healthy Children, Let's Eat Right to Keep Fit, and Let's Get Well, particularly Let's Have Healthy Children and Let's Get Well. Um, because she is a proponent of vitamins as a cure-all, right? So her later books are huge. They're very thick. They have thousands of citations in them. And um, a couple of children actually died because mothers followed advice in her books. Um, one mother uh, tried to treat a childhood illness with vitamins, which didn't work, and that child died. Um, and then another woman's child died of vitamin overdose. So doctors finally start to review all of her research and her citations. And they find that in the vast majority of cases, she's either um, misquoting or misunderstanding the research, um, or she's, she's just, her citations aren't correct at all. So. She actually dies in the 1970s of cancer, kind of largely discredited, which is sad to me because she, she had just kept to her regular nutritional advice and not gone into the medical advice field, she probably would have been fine. Um, but she's one of the first kind of pop culture 
uh, nutritionists in the United States that really sort of emphasizes um, the role of vitamins uh, in people's everyday lives. She's also a proponent of megadoses of vitamins, which we're gonna get into in a little bit. Um, we're gonna get into it right now, actually, with Linus Pauling. So Linus Pauling is this really interesting character. Um, he's a chemist, a biochemist, a chemical engineer, chemical engineer. He's a peace activist, an author, and a vitamin proponent. Uh, and he's one of very few people to win two Nobel Prizes. His first prize is in chemistry and his second prize was the Nobel Peace Prize for his work as a peace activist. Um, so in 1941, he contracts Bright's disease, which he manages with dietary treatments. So he already is very interested in the role of diet and health because of his management of his own disease. In 1968, he postulates in a paper that the megavitamin theory, which was a theory at the time, like Adele Davis, that megadoses of vitamins um, had curative or beneficial health properties. Um, so he postulates that, has that theory has scientific merit. Um, and he is one of the first people to popularize the association of vitamin C and the common cold. And it's because he has the science background and because he has the two Nobel prizes that gives his um, research and opinion so much weight among the general public. So the idea that vitamin C was would help against the common cold predates him. Obviously, this is an advertisement from 1941 that says guard against colds, the natural grapefruit way right, as an advertisement for canned Florida grapefruit juice. Um, but he published this book in 1976 called Vitamin C, the Common Cold and the Flu, uh, which basically says megadoses of vitamin C will cure you of the common cold and the flu and prevent you from getting it, right? Guess what? That's not how that actually works. Um, he actually becomes kind of discredited toward the end of his life because of this theory of megavitamin dosing, um, which is actually quite dangerous with certain vitamins. Um, vitamin C is not one of them because it just goes right through you. Um, but there's really no scientific evidence whatsoever that vitamin C has any impact on your immune system or the common cold. Zinc, on the other hand, might have some influence. There are some kind of interesting studies, including an interesting study connecting with coronavirus that zinc can actually boost your immune system a little bit, um, but vitamin C does not. And you'll notice front and center of this is orange juice, which is a big part of the marketing of orange juice, right? That it has vitamin C, which is essential, right? For human health, but it's not gonna cure the common cold. All right, now I wanna talk a little bit about sugar, right? Cause that's what I put in the title, when sugar was good for you. So there was a time in American history when sugar was considered a health food because carbohydrates give you energy and refined white sugar is the purest form of carbohydrates. So sugar gives you energy, right? Here's a great advertisement from the 1917 issue of the American Food Journal. The high food value of candy is accepted as a scientific fact, right? One of the most important food elements being carbohydrates, which supply fuel and energy. So um, yeah, it's a highly concentrated, highly nutritious food. Eat it regularly when you want it, same as any other food. So sugar being connected with energy is this concept that continues basically until fairly recently, until the end of the 20th century. Um, the only times that sugar is reduced in the American diet is during World War I and World War II, um, when it was actually rationed for both of them. World War I, most rationing was voluntary. Uh, sugar is the only thing that is actually officially rationed for part of the war toward the end in 1918. Um, so there's this little propaganda poster. It says, sugar, none on fruits. None in desserts, less on cereals, less in coffee and tea, less in preserving, basically eat less cake and candy and use other sweeteners. So when they say none in desserts, 
the sugar they're referring to is refined white sugar. So you can use other sweeteners during World War II, including corn syrup. That's one of the ways that corn syrup is popularized uh, with its use as a sugar alternative in World War I. Um, but studies have shown that world, the World War II diet, which is low in fat, very low in sugar, and high in vegetables and uh, whole grains, is actually one of the healthiest diets um, that you can eat, which I find very interesting. This is a post-war advertisement for post-sugar crisp cereal. Um, so this is saying it's good for kids too, right? Wholesome wheat for nourishment, special honey and sugar coating for energy flavor plus quick energy, right? It gives your kids energy, which is what a lot of sugary cereal is associated with post-war. Sugary cereal gives you energy. So it's a great food to eat early in the morning, right? <laughs> um, this next set of advertisements uh, I just found the other day and it was a little crazy for me to see them. Um, and this is the sugar industry's response to artificial sweeteners. So artificial sweeteners, I'm not gonna go super much into the history behind them. Um, they're largely developed from the late 19th, early 20th century. And then that research continues th through to World War II. Saccharin is one of the earliest ones. Teddy Roosevelt's doctor recommended that he have saccharin. Harvey Wiley, I don't know if anybody's seen um, The Poison Squad on PBS or read the book by the same title. Harvey Wiley was a researcher looking into um, food additives and their safety and saccharin was one of the things he examined and he said it was not safe. And Teddy Roosevelt was like, anyone who says saccharin is not safe is an idiot. <laughs> um, but artificial sweeteners really take off post-war, excuse me, as a diet food, right? So you start to get diet sodas in particular. Um, and these advertisements are re a reaction to that. So these advertisements are from the sugar industry. And the argument that they're making is that eating sugar <clears throat> helps satisfy your appetite so you don't overeat. Now, anyone who has tried this <laughs> knows that eating sugar usually just makes you want more sugar, right? But it's only 18 calories per teaspoon, except for if anybody knows their cooking measurements, a teaspoon is really not that big, right? Here's some more. This is like so awful, but it's, if you wanna avoid that fat time of day, right? midday when you might be really hungry, don't overeat, have sugar, have a soft drink, have a little snack, that's sugar. And that's supposed to help you keep on your diet. So of course today, today we know that that's totally not true and that sugar is one of the most insidious foods you can eat, right? It doesn't have any real nutritional value, refined white sugar. Um, it's often they're called empty calories, right? Um, but this is something that the sugar industry was trying to do to keep sales up. And that's something that post more in particular, um, food industries getting involved in trying to affect nutrition science becomes a little bit of a problem. So, you may have heard a couple of years ago, there was this big scandal reveal that the sugar industry was the reason why fat was connected to heart disease. And there is a grain of truth in that. The sugar lobby did fund a study into heart disease that connected it to fat. Uh, what most people don't know is that sugar is also connected to heart disease and the sugar lobby did not want that association to be made public. Um, but the research into fat and heart disease actually predates that study. So they may have been influential, but they weren't really the whole sole driver behind it. Um, but because there was association through kind of dubious 
research between fat and heart disease, uh, animal fats in particular and heart disease in the later mid-century, like 1950s, 1960s. By the time we get to the 1980s in particular, a lot of that information has kind of trickled down to the general public. And so you get a huge emphasis on low fat foods as health foods. Um, so you get things like snack wells. I don't know if anybody remembers snack wells. I remember snack wells in the 1990s. My mom had them in the house, right? They were supposed to be like guilt-free eating. Um, and also in the 1980s, things like egg white omelets, turkey, low fat pork, like these are all foods that people were consuming in an effort to avoid consuming fat because they thought that that would have a big impact on their weight, right? Not so much heart disease, even though that's what a lot of the, the research was about, um, but it, people kind of glommed onto it as this sort of cure-all. If you ate low-fat foods, you wouldn't be overweight, you wouldn't get fat because you weren't eating fat. But that's not really the case. People are forgetting that sugar, while it does provide energy, if you don't metabolize it, it gets stored as fat. So that kind of backfired a little bit for a lot of people. Um, in response, a lot of diet foods did contain artificial sweeteners, right? So you would it would be a low fat food with an artificial sweetener. So it's very low calorie in general. Um, but the main issue with low fat foods is that when you're taking the fat out, you're taking the flavor out. And in order to make it palatable, you have to add some other flavoring back in, which is usually sugar, right? Um, so that's kind of its whole issue. We're starting to sort of understand now more, I think um, we were talking a little bit before the talk started about the role of sugar in our diet, um, but it's really not great. And so there's more emphasis today on reducing sugar consumption um, and reducing the consumption of refined carbohydrates like snack wells, which are highly refined. So I did also wanna talk a little bit about um, nutrition reporting in the media, uh, because I think how Americans in particular view nutrition and food um, is heavily influenced by how nutrition science is reported in the media. So we have already had a tendency um, to kind of in our American history to kind of like glom on to food fads and food diets and interesting things in part because we don't really have any more a connection. We don't have a longstanding food tradition like a lot of other countries around the world do. We don't have centuries of food traditions where people were staying in one place and heavily influenced by their local indigenous foods and are developing traditional food ways. Um, that does exist in the United States, particularly among indigenous communities, but the vast majority of Americans do not eat that way because of our cultural background. So a lot of us are immigrants. Um, a lot of us, our families have moved around within the country. Uh, so we're really divorced from regional food ways, from indigenous food ways, from traditional food ways. Uh, and so I think we're more susceptible <laughs> to um, new exciting information and kind of um, accepting things at face value because we don't have these traditional food ways to act as kind of a counterpoint to that. So for example, let's talk about nutrition reporting of antioxidant rich foods. Like, so in the past couple of decades, I'm sure you've seen all sorts of stuff about chocolate is good for you because it's rich in antioxidants, especially dark chocolate. Wine is good for you and coffee is good for you. And so a lot of the reporting about nutrition in the media seems to be reduced to blanket statements about what's good for you and what's bad for you and not really communicating any of the nuance of the studies, right? And this is a problem with science reporting in general. I don't know if anybody had seen very recently um, the scientific study about mask efficacy with coronavirus and that neck gaiters were worse than not wearing a mask at all. 
except for the study that the media cited was actually not a study about mask efficacy. It was a study to prove whether or not the, um, basically the research method was effective and they just happened to use masks and coronavirus. <coughs> so actually gators are more effective than not wearing a mask. It kind of blew up in the media and became this whole thing because media reporting in general tends to be fairly science illiterate um, and scientists themselves are not always good communicators um, to non-scientists about their research, right? So this is the thing that antioxidant rich foods are very good for you, um, but as with all things, you have to take into account some of the other aspects of that food that might mean you don't want to consume a lot of it. Um, also on this list are acai berries and acai bowls. I don't know if you guys have seen those. You can get them at like smoothie places now, right? And they're supposed to be health food, but it's just a fruit, a dark colored fruit. And it's the dark color that's good for you, not necessarily the fruit itself. Anyway, um, eggs and cholesterol, right? I talked a little bit about egg whites, that the yolks are really bad for you. And then it's like, oh, all of a sudden, oh, wait, no, eggs aren't that bad for you. But then it was like, oh no, well, you still shouldn't eat more than one a day. <laughs> like the, this kind of back and forth about what's good and what's not good um, can be very confusing to people and can discredit, I think, nutrition science and nutrition reporting in general. And that is partially because of nutrition science and nutrition studies itself. Um, there have been some recent critiques of nutrition science and nutrition science studies um, because when you're dealing with human nutrition, the human population is so diverse that making blanket statements is problematic, right? So there are some other problems with a lot of nutrition science um, studies. So there's the study size. It's very difficult to get a big enough study with enough people to know that maybe you're actually on the right track in your study. Some nutrition science studies are as small as like 40 people. Um, there's also study length. Um, in order to really track the impact maybe of your study or nutrition, you probably should be doing it for like a decade or more. But funding that is incredibly expensive and incredibly time consuming. And so there's a tendency to do shorter, smaller studies um, that aren't necessarily as applicable because they're shorter and smaller. There's also an issue in nutrition science um, as a whole with where there's not a lot of study replication. So in the scientific community as a whole, um, in order to prove your theory, uh, your hypothesis in order for it to become a theory, somebody else has to replicate your study. And that is very difficult with nutrition science um, because there are so many variables. So you get the issue where scientists themselves are not willing necessarily to try and replicate their own studies and where other scientists are not trying to replicate the studies of other scientists. Um, and then finally, a lot of studies are kind of accepted without a lot of critique. Um, I think in part because that happens a lot in science in general, even though um, peer review can be a very important part of science, scientific studies and publication. Uh, not everybody goes through peer review. And also the media tends to report things without critique either because they get an announcement or they see, hey, this person did this study about coffee and what's the end result? Oh, coffee has some health benefits. So all of a sudden a coffee is healthy for you, right? And it might have some health benefits, but that's really reductionist reporting. So I don't have any solution. I'm not a nutrition scientist. Um, I'm not a dietitian, but these are the things that I have observed about nutrition reporting in the media. And I hope that we can start to do better because I think human nutrition is really important. Um, and I hope also that 
the medical field starts to take nutrition a little more seriously. I think in part because, and this happens with food history as well, um, nutrition science has been traditionally very associated with women. And so I think it's kind of been dismissed in the medical field. Same thing with food and food history has largely been associated with women. So historically it was very dismissed in the history field. Um, so you get people who are graduating with medical degrees and they've maybe had a semester of nutrition science training. And nutrition science is so, nutrition is so crucial to a lot of health issues in the United States that I really hope that in the future, doctors get more training. So what are my conclusions about nutrition in America? Um, nutrition science is a very young science. Um, it's really only been around seriously for the last hundred years. People are making new discoveries all the time. Um, important ones like about antioxidants and free radicals and chemical pesticide research and endocrine related research. Um, a lot of nutrition science tends to be funded. I shouldn't say a lot, but there's a fair amount of nutrition science that's funded by agricultural booster groups, right? The sugar industry, the you know dairy industry, the almond industry. So I'd like to see a little bit more space between those groups and more federal, un, kind of unattached federal funding um, for nutrition science. Uh, the World War II diet, as I mentioned earlier, um, is one of the healthiest ones. And so I'd like to see a lot of nutrition rhetoric go back to emphasizing nutrients rather than calories. We still have a lot of being wedded to calories, which can be damaging in many ways. Uh, and then finally, I would like to see people be more science literate, not only ordinary everyday people, but also people in media and politics. And I would like to see scientists become better communicators. Historians are usually pretty good communicators. Scientists have to work on their communication skills a little. They are, they're getting better at it, but it still needs work. And where to find the best information? This is a tough one because um, dietitians are usually the best source of information, but it kind of depends on your dietitian because there's still a lot of um, opinions about nutrition that aren't necessarily backed up by the science. And there's still a lot of science that isn't necessarily um, solid science yet, because as I said, it hasn't been replicated. So I hope that because you're watching this talk and you're interested in nutrition science and nutrition history and that you will go and do your own research um, and try to become better informed about the history. So do we have any questions? That ended up going longer than I thought, but thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, I'm trying to think of questions. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Catherine. What are your thoughts about um, the recent sort of focus on plant-based diets? Ooh, that's a good one. So um, I good thought question. actually about talking about the history of vegetarianism in the United States, but that's like a whole other talk, I think, because yeah. it's such a huge topic. Um, I am not personally vegetarian, but I do eat vegetarian and vegan a lot. Um, so I don't have huge opinions one way or the other. I'm a little concerned personally with, with straight veganism because I think it does, a lot of veganism does rely a lot on processed foods, which I think are not as good. Um, and there's also some environmental factors in there, but I think definitely people should eat way more vegetables. And I think Americans, um, because of our food traditions and kind of being divorced from our traditional food traditions. Um, we don't eat as many vegetables as we should. Uh, and historic cookbooks have a surprising number of tasty and delicious vegetable recipes. So that's like one of the reasons why, I don't know, I didn't mention, but all these bookshelves behind me, this is my historic cookbook collection. 
I have like 500 cookbooks. It's ridiculous. Um, but that's one of the things I look for when I'm collecting cookbooks is do they have interesting vegetable recipes? Because that's how I most want to apply it to my own life. Cool. Oh. Can I ask a question, Sarah? Instead of talking yes. about, um, do you have good resources that you've come across for? Um, I'm actually tr interested in finding out about soy and how it and other isoflavins like that. Um, I guess that's really the word, maybe not, um, for estrogen stuff related to cancer. Do you have any good resources to turn to? Because I've asked nutritionists at hospitals and they don't seem to really have any good resources. I don't have good resources connecting soy to estrogen. Um, most of what I know about soy is about the, the history of soy, which really gets a start in the 1930s and 1940s that um, nutritionists and scientists and agriculturalists really start pushing soy as a high protein meat alternative, really in the 1930s and 40s, which is probably earlier than a lot of people think. Um, but I don't know of any scientific specifically studies that, that Great. are about Thanks. this. Yeah, sorry. I figured I'd throw it out there because you never know you're a genius and you got this stuff going, so you never know. <laughs> yeah, that's a little that's a little more recent. I, I did get delve a little bit more into more recent stuff, but um, yeah, most of my stuff tends to be early 20th century, so not too much that's estrogen right. research going on. At that not, not so much, not so much, but hey, you never know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, um, I just wanted to, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, comment on um, uh, the use of pesticides and um, additives. Uh, saccharin, um, the artificial sweeteners, the FDA, um, I mean, I think you know, the sugar industry in bed with the um, FDA on not um, declaring it carcin carcinogenic. Um, and when it has been proven in studies um that it is um and the flat out denial uh yeah that's definitely i didn't get into much to um the history of the fda which i probably could have but then this talk would have been probably two or three hours. Oh, and, <laughs> I, I think i need to do yeah, a whole wait, wait, be here uh, quite a while yeah, yeah but that's definitely an issue in the united states that um there's, it's such a weird kind of incestuous relationship. Lo lobbyists, between, lobbyists. Yeah, well, so in the United States, yeah. the United States, there's federal funding for agricultural, agricultural products booster boards. Like the almond board, the American almond board receives federal funding. The dairy industry board wow. receives federal funding. So there's this weird kind of conflict of interest where you have these federal boards that are receiving federal funds to promote specific products generally. And this is like specific agricultural products, not specific brands. So like almonds, sugar, the dairy industry, the beef industry, peanuts, you know, they all have oranges, they all have federally funded boards. But then their boosterism is kind of in conflict with maybe federally funded research which how is that are those federal funds allocated and because there's been less and less and less federal funding to universities who are doing the research where is that funding vacuum coming from it's coming from industry so that is a kind of a big issue in science in general that there's is there influence or not between where the funding is coming from and what research is being prioritized and what results are happening. Um, so definitely that is, saccharin is one tiny fraction of, of the issues with funding and scientific research for sure. Yeah. And then I was reading about the redaction of some of these studies, what, you know, that the food, let's call it a food industry is received the funds. And then, you know, if I have the right party, the government having the right to redact the research. I mean, it's, it is insane. <laughs> there have also been a number of studies that have been retracted as well, because they were published and then the sign, like the, somebody actually went and re renewed 
the research or looked at the data and they're like, oh, you're actually misinterpreting this data or, you know, you're not using a big enough sample size or coming to the wrong conclusions. So that's why peer review, although in the history industry, <laughs> peer review can be painfully slow sometimes. It's a little bit better in science because they're publishing so much more often. Um, but that's, I think, why peer review is so important and study replication in mm -hmm. particular is so important, particularly in nutrition science, because um, it's not really a confirmed study until someone else is able to replicate it. But that's very difficult with nutrition because humans are so diverse. So it's kind of a catch-22. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions? me what did, what did you say was the name of the pbs show that was on one of the sugar alternatives i didn't hear what you said yes um it's called the poison squad and oh. it's based on a book by the same name by a historian called deborah bloom b-l-u-m um and it's about the life and work of harvey wiley who was a usda scientist studying uh, food additives at the turn of the 20th century. And it's called the Poison Squad because he had a, a group of young men who he paid to eat food, but it was all adulterated food. So some of them got sick because of it, but that was part of the study. So yeah, it's a great, it's a great show. Definitely, I haven't read the book, I, it's on my list, but the show is definitely worth watching. Any other questions? No. Uh, was this recorded? Uh, are, is this going to be made available uh, at all through the library? We did record it. Um, okay. We don't usually, sometimes we put, we will put it up on our YouTube channel. I'll have to uh, confirm that with the director, but and then if I do, I'll, I'll send you guys an email and let you know. Okay, uh, that was my next question. <laughs> if you'll do that. Thank you. Hopefully I won't get too many bad YouTube comments. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you will. I don't think you know, will. I'm not a nutritionist, but it was it was really interesting um, doing this research because I have been interested in, in the history of nutrition science for a long time. So it was nice to finally put the talk together. So thank you for being my guinea pigs and listening. Oh, great. <laughs> my first time thank you. <laughs> yeah, I have a nutrition background. So that, that was great. Good. Yeah. Good. We'll, Good have to ask you, we'll have to ask you back again, because you're just really entertaining. and Yes. Well, maybe yeah. I should do one on the history of vegetarianism next. All right. Well, okay. Yes. <laughs> Continue right. in our nutrition science scene. I do actually, I am just going to announce um, something that I'm very excited about, which is uh, I'm doing a partnership with the Poughkeepsie Library. Um, a librarian there has asked me to do a whole series on the history of comfort foods. Oh, and wow. so it's going to be a recorded cooking demonstration by me within a follow-up history. And we're going to be doing a one a month starting next month. So wow, send me the link. Yes. I will. Yeah, Absolutely. it's on my website too. Guys. Some of the, the November and December ones, the registration link is already up. So in November, we're doing pumpkin pie. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the history of pumpkins and pumpkin pie spice. And then in December, we're doing um, Indian pudding, which I'm I, very I grew excited up about because I've always wanted to try and I've never had. so. I'm going to have to make it twice, it. once to test it and once for the demo. Um, and then we'll be talking about the history of um, corn and cornmeal and molasses in New England cuisine. And then in January, we're going to do mac and cheese and the history of macaroni and cheese. And in February, we're going to do hot chocolate and hot cocoa. So, well, maybe we have to talk about you doing some such program here in Rye. Well, once I do it for a Poughkeepsie library, I can do it for anybody. So. Yeah. Sounds great. All, All right. right. Any last questions before we're done for the evening? No. Yep. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. Great. It was really great, yeah. Sarah. Thank you. 
And have a good night, everybody. Okay. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Thanks, library. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Royal Library. You're welcome. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye.